Games rated E to M. Welcome to Nintendo Power Podcast. This episode, we celebrate the 30th anniversary of Game Boy by remembering our favorite Game Boy games. My name is Chris Slade, and joining me today are Dan Osen from Nintendo Treehouse. Hi, Dan. Hi, Chris. Hi, thanks for coming on the show. And Jeremy Parrish, the Senior Creative Director at Greenland Content. Hi, Jeremy. Hey, Chris. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for coming on. And we're here today to celebrate a big anniversary. Now, as of July 31st, it has been 30 years. That's three decades since the North American launch of Game Boy. Uh, it launched in July 31st, 1989, and lasted for over 10 years in various you know, colors and models like Game Boy Pocket and Game Boy Color. And now, technically, I think Nintendo's handheld game systems kind of started with the Game & Watch series, but Game Boy was really the first one to have interchangeable games that, you know, a lot of people, um, that really put portable gaming on the map for a lot of people. And it kicked off, obviously, a legacy of, of dedicated Nintendo handhelds that continued on with Game Boy Advance, Nintendo DS, Nintendo 3DS, and uh, even the upcoming Nintendo Switch Lite. Um, now, Jeremy, I'm excited to have you here because so much of your work has been about classic games and systems. What is it you remember the most when you think back uh, about the Game Boy? Oh, man, when I think back about Game Boy, you know, I never actually owned one until Game Boy Color, uh, which maybe explains my fascination with the system. It's kind of like a making up for FOMO. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just think about... Um, uh, I don't know. Uh, actually, my strongest memories are with uh, Super Game Boy and playing games like uh, The Legend of Zelda: Link's Awakening and Metroid Two on uh, you know on Super Game Boy, and not not really experiencing those on the original handheld. And then kind of going to the original handheld and 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 having this different experience with these games that I'd played on television and realizing you know taking a game with you and you know being in the car or sitting on a couch or whatever when you're playing. And being broken away from the television is a different experience, and it's something that really resonates with me. So that's that's kind of the, I guess, the revelation that, oh, yeah, portable gaming is really cool and different, and I like it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this day and age, portable gaming, having you know dozens or hundreds of games in your pocket is, uh, is pretty common. But back then, the idea that you wouldn't be tethered to a television was such a revolutionary concept. And, um, and Dan, so... You actually, I mean, I'm, obviously I'm sure you're a big Game Boy player, but uh, you're also a fellow Nintendo Power Magazine alum. You um, actually helped localize some big Game Boy games. So what is it that you think about when you think back to Game Boy? Um, you know, it, it was sort of a revolutionary system. There were, It was definitely one of the, it felt like a really complete system in terms of a handheld uh, gaming experience. Um, just everything about it, it just... It just felt solid. The cartridges had, just had a nice uh, size to them. It was a complete system. I, th I think we originally, uh, it came with batteries, so you didn't need to worry about batteries not being included. Um, and it had headphones, too, which also came with it. So um, it just felt like you were getting everything in the box. Um, I can remember that um, pretty clearly. And then, you know, working on the games, obviously, um, you know, the system uh, had some limitations compared to the games that were being played on TV. But I think that uh, those limitations really bred uh, creativity. And I think uh, the developers really did some really clever things to just get the most out of that system and make the games, you know, approach the same sort of fun experience that you you play on a console. And so, um, you know, from that standpoint, it just felt like a really uh, leap in, in handheld gaming, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I remember buying the Game Boy at launch, and um, and I was really excited to play Super Mario Land, which I did enjoy, but I had never even played any version of Tetris up to that point, which sounds weird now when you think about how it had been around on PCs and things, but I think a lot of people, their first experience to Tetris probably was as the pack-in game for Game Boy, and I really got sucked in by that game. And as much as I enjoyed you know, a lot of the other games on it, including Super Mario Land, Tetris was the one that, that I kind of set everything to the side to to just become obsessed with. Um, now, uh, in honor of the anniversary, I asked each of you to pick your five favorite games from the original Game Boy. Now, this won't count um, games that were made exclusively for Game Boy Color. Um, plus, I asked you to pick one hidden gem game that maybe not everyone has heard of. So um, let's take turns counting down the games in your lists. Dan, how about you kick us off with your number five game? 
Number five. Well, this was really hard to pick uh, just five games, and I left I left some off because they're you know the obvious ones. I tried to not go too obscure, but really just talk about ones that were were my personal favorites. And at number five, I have the game Kicks. Ah. Q I X. This was a Nintendo uh, version of an arcade game, and it obviously it came out on a ton of other systems. But Nintendo published the version on the Game Boy, and um, I had played this in the in the arcade a lot um, back in the day. And uh, when it came out on the the Game Boy system, the thing that I thought was really cool about it was you could play uh, two player simultaneously um, on the screen, and um, it was just it was just a neat game um, that I always liked. Really simple, where you're just kind of drawing uh, boxes to capture the the space on the screen. But um, it it was just one of my favorites. I played a lot of it, <laughs> even when it came out on Game Boy. So um, and obviously the Game Boy graphics um, were able to capture the game really well and. Um, it was just a fun game and the sound also I think was really unique on that game um, I just really love the kind of gritty synth uh, noises that they got out of the Game Boy for that one yeah absolutely Kicks is a, a game that I used to really like in the arcade you don't hear people reminisce about that one so much but uh, so I'm glad you brought that up um, Jeremy how about you what's your number five I didn't realize we were doing this as a countdown. Um, (laughs) I guess for number five, I'll put that as Gargoyle's Quest by Mm. Capcom, which was a spinoff of the Ghost and Goblin series. And the Ghost and Goblins games never quite, they've never quite resonated with me. Um, Like, I respect them, but they're very, very difficult and very kind of punishing. And Gargoyle's Quest is a little more my pace. It's still a difficult game. Uh, like you're not going to pick up Gargoyle's Quest and just breeze through it. It's really hard, but it it kind of softens that by adding a lot of role playing elements. So you play as a you play as like the the demonic villain, you know, one of the 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 kind of the notorious nemesis character, the Red Armor from Ghost and Goblins, who trashes you at the beginning of or like midway through the first stage in the original game. But this time he's kind of the anti hero. And as you go through the game, he becomes more powerful and gains the ability to fly and to shoot more powerful weapon or like breath beams, I guess, and to stick to walls and cover spikes and things like that. So, you know, as you're kind of exploring and talking to people through the demon world, um, you're getting stronger. So it's a very satisfying kind of inversion of the Ghost and Goblins formula where you uh, don't quite feel so overwhelmed. Yeah, I, I totally agree. The Ghost and Goblins games, I loved as a kid. I don't Looking back on it, I don't know how I ever stuck it out um, to get through those games. Um, but, uh, but Gargoyle's Quest was one that, that made it a bit more accessible. And I think I may have actually played, I think there was a Super NES uh, iteration. Was it called Demon's mm-hmm. Quest? Um, yep. That, uh, that I got turned on to and really um, enjoyed that one. Then I think I went back and found Gargoyle's Quest later on, but... But yeah, those, both of those games are great. Um, for my number five, I picked um, Mario Peace or Mario's Picross, I should say, um, which c- probably could have been my hidden gem game. But I just I, I'm such a big fan of Picross. I have a lot of Picross games on my Nintendo Switch right now, and um, and that was another one that I didn't. I think when it first came out, I wasn't even aware of it. Um, but I went back and found it later, and I just think that those types of um, you know number puzzle games work so well on handheld systems uh, that it's uh, that, that's something I think I considered from my list a lot was not just what were great games but what really fit the format of, of the Game Boy well and I would definitely say that Mario's Peak Cross is one of them mm-hmm. yep all right so Dan your number four my number four is Donkey Kong the one that came out in 1994 um, you know this was Obviously, you're maybe sensing a theme that games that appeared in arcades are among my favorites. Um, and this one kind of started out there, but um, I love the way that it kind of expanded the Donkey Kong universe and had, you know, new levels and new thing, new challenges and things like that. And it was another one that I think uh, I remember feeling that it kind of really pushed the envelope of what the Game Boy could do. And um, of course, it was kind of coming out a little later. Um, so I think the developers had had time to, to perfect some techniques. But I also liked a lot of the things that they added um, when you played it on Super Game Boy with, uh, with the kind of frame that looked like the old Donkey Kong machine and things like that. So um, I just remember playing a lot of that game and, and just enjoying the re-entry into the, to the kind of arcade world of Donkey Kong. 
And obviously we've seen that continue to evolve over time, but um, this one still kind of had its foot still back in the old classics and, and was kind of stepping forward to the future. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that game, um, I mean, Donkey Kong's my favorite arcade game of all time. And, and this one um, started with those same levels from the mm-hmm. arcade version, then added like 100 more right. or something like that. And, uh, yeah. you know, spoiler alert, that's, that's much higher on my list. Um, so I'm gl- <laughs> but I'm glad you, you went ahead and brought it up. Glad to know I wasn't the only one uh, who, was, who was really thinking about that game. And, um, and you mentioned the Super Game Boy as well. Some people might not be aware that uh, they released uh, what essentially was shaped like a Super NES cartridge that would fit into your Super NES console. And you could put, you know, Game Boy games in there and play them on the TV, and mm-hmm. I think uh, Donkey Kong was one of the ones that would uh, had a special color palette assigned to it to put those black and white games in color, and so it was a great experience playing it on the TV as well. Mm-hmm. All right, so Jeremy, you're number four, and sorry that I'm on the spot making you put them in order, so it's okay that, if you okay. want to reorder them a little later. All right, well, uh, my Donkey Kong is going to be higher up the list too, so uh, I think <laughs> sorry, we'll, we'll all the get there eventually. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's okay. I think we'll probably all have different things to bring to the table about it. Yeah. Uh, for number four, I'm, I'm going to say the Final Fantasy Legend, mm. which of course is not actually a Final Fantasy game. It was part of the Saga series, and there's a few of those coming out uh, in the next few months or next year or so for Switch, actually. And the series has kind of been going strong for the past, I don't know, um, 25, 30 years. Uh, but... You know, this this game looks a lot like a sort of traditional role-playing game, but uh, once you actually start playing it, you realize it does a lot of different things. Like, you don't have really set characters. You can create characters from different uh, races, and each race has its own abilities. Like humans, you can give them lots of armor and stuff. Then you have mutants who learn magic, and it's very random. Like, sometimes they'll forget a spell and learn a new spell, and you can't really predict what's going to happen. There's also monsters who seem unpredictable, but actually have kind of the system to them where when you defeat a monster in combat, the monster in your party can eat that monster's, the, the defeated monster's meat and will will change into something based on the kind of meat they, they consume. And it may be more powerful. It may be less powerful. There's like, like I said, there's a whole system about it. It's very complex, but if you can figure it out, um, then you can like, you know, you can eat enemy bosses basically and become really powerful for a while. So there's all this kind of interesting stuff happening with the systems. And then the world itself is really interesting because it all takes place inside a tower, but there's, there's all these kingdoms inside the tower. And as you ascend, you eventually find out like the, the (laughs) God who created this tower is, is basically kind of running experiments on all life. And you're like, hey, that's not cool. And you fight him with the chainsaw and stuff. It's it's a really strange take on RPGs. And the Saga series has always been very idiomatic. And I really, really respect that about it. The the, the guy who creates it, uh, you know, kind of the, the overseer of it is Akitoshi Kawazu, who is, I think, one of the underappreciated sort of quirky innovators of video gaming, one of the auteurs. So I always enjoy seeing what he comes up with, even if I'm kind of like, man, I don't get this game. Like, I respect the fact that he's afraid, not afraid to make a game where you're like, I don't get this. Right, yeah. No, that's that's great. I'm glad you brought that game up. I don't have any um, RPGs on my personal list, but there were actually several really good ones on Game Boy. Um so uh, I think we're up to my number four then, which would be uh, Super Mario Land 2, Six Golden Coins. Um, I kind of have, um, to be honest, the original Super Mario Land is kind of has the, the most nostalgic place in my heart. I can still kind of hear that classic theme from that game looping in my head. But um, there's no denying that they really upped the graphics and, and the, the volume of content and everything for the second game. And it introduced um, Wario for the first time as the final boss in the game which was interesting. And it's just one of the weirdest, wackiest Super Mario games. I mean, you've got the the bunny ears kind of power up. You've got weird levels that looks like you're inside of a giant toy version of Mario. So it seemed um, kind of like what you were mentioning, mentioning Jeremy, about um, the other game is that this was a very ex- um, experimental kind of iteration of, uh, of the Super Mario series, uh, which, again, I really appreciate. So now we're on to our top three. Dan, what's your number three game? Right. Uh, my number three game is the uh, Pokemon trading card game. Um, 
it was just such a great uh, representation of the of the card game, which had come out, you know, around the same time or, or fairly close to it, I, I believe. Um, and just the uh, the story that they added and the way that you progress through the game and collect the cards and can build your deck um, was was just really fun. I remember it being a really good uh, just way to learn how to play the game and appreciate it. Um, and you know. Being a big fan of card games, it, it just really kind of hit a sweet spot for me, and that was, uh, you know, obviously Pokemon was was still pretty new then, and it was it was just a great way to get get into the franchise outside of the core game. So, um, I I think my top five here is probably based on hours played, and mm. the, the the three games that I've mentioned so far, um, this one I I probably put the most hours in for sure. Well, great, Jeremy. What would you put at your number three? All right. Well, we uh, we've touched on the the Super Game Boy a little bit, so I want to give a, a call out to the game that is the the crowning achievement of the Super Game Boy, which is Space Invaders. Mm. And it may seem kind of weird to say, "Oh, that's a really old arcade game. What's so great about that on Game Boy?" But uh, when when it was published in the U.S. in like 1994, 95, uh, it was actually a first party game. And in, instead of just being, you know, like the arcade game. Uh, put on Game Boy, which it was. They also just they went all in on this, and instead of just giving it a a um, Super Game Boy frame, they used Super Game Boy to give you like colorized versions that imitated the the acetate uh, color strips that they used on the black and white monitors in the arcades to uh, mimic, you know, actually having color graphics which weren't available at the time. But then on top of that, they actually stuck a Super NES game inside the Game Boy cartridge. And if you put it into your Super Game Boy and choose to launch the the Super NES version, it will reset your Super Game Boy in your system and launch as a Super NES game. And it's a full Super NES game hidden in this Game Boy cartridge. It's, It's completely like... I had no idea they could do this until I discovered this game a couple of years ago and was like, why didn't more people do this? I guess because it's kind of ridiculous and why would you, you know, why would you do something so so esoteric and so complicated? But, you know, the fact is that that was a possibility and someone actually did it. And the result is a, a really just a loving recreation of a, a formative arcade classic. And in, in my opinion, you know, Maybe the the Game Boy version isn't the most authentic, like arcade perfect version of Space Invaders, but I kind of feel it's the one that that demonstrates the most love for the original game and really says like, hey, you know, this was a an innovative work of technology and game design in 1978, uh, and here it is, you know, more, almost 20 years later, and we're also pushing the edge, the you know, pushing the envelope with it still. Mm-hmm. That's great. I, I had no idea about that. I'm glad you mentioned it. <laughs> My son. Yeah, that one would have made my top ten. <laughs> yeah, my son actually is—he's uh, just turned nine. But um, I was very happy to see that he can still appreciate the classics, and he came across an old arcade machine for Space Invaders and really enjoyed it. So I'm gonna have to hunt this game down now so he can check it out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's definitely a like I said, kind of the crowning achievement of the Super Super Game Boy. Uh, it's it's definitely worth experiencing just to see what the system's little add-on, little peripheral could do. Yeah, and that was a great accessory. I do still have that one, so I'm ready to go as soon as I get Space Invaders. <laughs> awesome. Well, my number three, uh, which I think um, I'm suspecting um, you guys might even, uh, uh, well, it seems pretty obvious at this point, at least one of you I'm sure has it higher, would be The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening. Um, this game holds up incredibly well, um, and you know I'm really looking forward to playing through the reimagined version on Nintendo Switch. Uh, and uh, it's... Um, it's just filled with so many quirky, memorable characters um, that even kind of your incidental um, contact that you have with these these NPCs um, can be very memorable. And it's also a, a, among all of the Legend of Zelda games, it's it's one of the ones that I tend to get stumped in the most. Even if I'm replaying it and I kind of know what I'm doing, I, I it, my memory just fails me at certain points, and and I get kind of um, uh, uh, pulled into it pretty deeply all over again as if I'm playing it for the first time. So I've always appreciated that about it. And um, it's just one of those games you can play over and over every couple of years and just uh, maybe see something new in it. It's also kind of a very experimental game. We talked about that before with other titles. You know, here's a game that kind of, um, you know, as the story goes, started as a uh, after work project for the team and ultimately became a full fledged game. Has some great cameos in there from some Mario characters and things like that. And and uh, even worked with uh, 
uh, or you know, maybe I'm confusing this with the Game Boy Color version in terms of working with the Game Boy Printer and the Game Boy, uh, yeah, the Game Boy Printer. But uh, you know, it just continued to experiment, and um, it's just always going to be one of the most uh, quirky, memorable, uh, uh, memorable uh, Zelda games I've ever played. Yep, I had that one higher on my list. <laughs> All right, well, we'll hear more think, about that I, one soon. I think it says a lot about the quality of the game that it's been remade twice now, and it's pretty much, you know, the same game, just, you know, presented with better fidelity each time. That's right. And, you know, this is a game that I missed out on um, playing, or at least I didn't play all the way through it right when it first came out. And the version that I ultimately did beat was the Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening DX for Game Boy Color, um, which added, um, like, a new uh, color-based dungeon and some things like that. So, uh, and then, of course, we're getting even more features added with the Nintendo Switch version. Uh, so it's great to just see that the, you know, this is a, a classic game that keeps getting better. All right. So, uh, Dan, your number two game, my number two game. Um, I, I kind of went back and forth on this because, um, I just put pinball games, but the one I'm particularly thinking about is Kirby's pinball land, but I want to give a shout out to revenge of the Gator because, uh. um, that is just a classic. But the one that I probably spent more time playing is uh, Kirby's Pinball Land. And every time that's released on, you know, when it came out for 3DS, I got it again and played it. Um, I, I don't know how many hours I spent playing that, trying to get high scores and beating all the bosses. It was just such a such a fun game. Um, and uh, I, I'm a big pinball fan, too. So um, this was, I think, one of the best uh, Game Boy pinball games. Um, obviously, when uh, Color Game Boy came out, um, there were some really good ones on there, too. But, um, you know, this was this was a game that I probably spent, you know, the most time on of all the ones we've talked about so far. Uh, you know, that's that's a great game. And then also, I'm glad you mentioned, uh, um, what was it? Return of the Gator? Revenge of the Gator. Revenge of the Revenge. Gator. That is a game that I haven't thought about since I played it. But I did play it back when it was new. And wow, you just pulled something out of my memory I didn't know was even in there. That was a great game. Yep, I'm cheating because I, I could have put that on my overlooked ones, but I, I want to want to put it here right with uh, Kirby's Pinball, and I think there might have even been a little bit of crossover on the dev teams on those. I'm not sure for for sure um, because that was a HAL game, but um, yeah, it, it, both are really great pinball games. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think HAL is uh, has an amazing legacy of pinball games. I would love mm -hmm. to see them make some some modern day pinball games, but you know, I think Mr. Iwata's first role with Nintendo was working on pinball for Famicom for NES. Uh, and doing some programming on that. So it's just, it's like in the company's blood. And I'd, I'd love to see them get back to that and, you know, surprise us with something. At yeah, some point. you don't see a ton of pinball games anymore, but, um, you know, there's still some good ones. And there used to be some really good ones um, back in the day on some of these older systems like Game Boy, for sure. Um, okay, Jeremy, your number two game. All right. Um, so I think for my number two game, I'm going to go with Donkey Kong, uh, the 1994 game. Uh, I know... Dan mentioned that earlier, but you know my my perspective on it is that it's one that I completely overlooked for years, maybe maybe a decade. I, you know, I saw it at the store and thought, well, uh, you know, that's that's a ten year old game, a fifteen year old game. Why would I want to play that now? And just completely blew it off until people started saying, hey, you need to check this out if you love portable games and you love classic games. How can you not know about Donkey Kong ninety four? And you you play it, and at first it seems like a very straightforward take on Donkey Kong. But then you start to realize, like, Mario can do stuff that he couldn't do in Donkey Kong. He has, like, all of his Mario 64 moves, basically. He can do handstands and, like, triple jumps and stuff. And this was two years before Mario 64. So it's kind of like they were testing out ideas for Mario uh, and his 3D leap with this game. And then you, you get through the, the four stages of the arcade game, and there's 96 more stages that get more and more complex and turn into these you know, portable puzzle action stages. They they bring in Donkey Kong Jr. mechanics. Like there's, you know, crossover with the Super Mario games. It's just a, it's a loving recreation, kind of like the Space Invaders game, but in a different way. It's less about, you know, a faithful recreation and more like a reimagination of, you know, 15, 20 years of Donkey Kong history, um, stretching back not only to the arcade game, but even like some of the Game & Watch stuff. It's, it's just a... You know, just just an amazing love letter to the whole franchise. It's really great. Yeah, it is great. I think um, I think amongst um, you know long longtime fans or serious collectors, everybody knows about Donkey Kong. But I think I, you could, despite that, you could almost consider this still a hidden gem game, just because it feels like for how good it is, 
it should be on the tip of everyone's tongue. It, it should have been something that, that just everyone was aware of. And, and maybe part of it is because the, the title was simply Donkey Kong. Maybe a lot of people thought it was just that original game again, but it really is so much more than that. And that's actually my number two as well. Um, and I don't know mo- what there is much more to say other than I-, I love standing on my hands and catching barrels on my feet. And I wish I could do that in more mm-hmm. Mario games. <laughs> All right. So now we are down to the final selections. Dan, what is your number one all-time favorite Game Boy game? Well, I felt like this was cheating a little bit, but I, I had The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening as my number one. <laughs> uh, not but cheating at all. I did play a lot of it. <laughs> but yeah, that is one of the games that you worked on in localization, right? Yep, yep. I, I worked on, on the original uh, text and um, as a result played a lot of it. And um, I still, when I heard they were remaking it, I was super excited because I want to play it again. Um, you know, I got, got a chance to uh, work with the team a little on, on the, the, the new version, which is going to retain mo- the text, you know, r- basically from the original game, um, with a few tweaks here and there. And that was a lot of fun. Um, I almost was like, I don't want to see all this stuff cause I've forgotten some of it. I want it to be, feel kind of new, but, um, they did a great job and we're, you know, we're doing it on, uh, uh, some other languages as well, which haven't, haven't been available before, uh, you know, French and Spanish. And so, um, it's going to reach a lot of new players too, I think, um, which is really exciting to me. I want to see how, how people react because it's, um, you know, obviously it's a lot different from Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, um, where you have this open world and you can go do whatever you want. Um, in this game, you're on a little tiny island. And, um, I mean, when I say tiny, I don't mean like minuscule, it's still pretty large and there's a lot to do there, but it's definitely, uh, a little more, uh, constricted in terms of, uh, of where you can go. And, uh, I think that, uh, obviously it bred a lot of creativity with the team to create, uh, some really unique puzzles and, and riddles and things like that. But I think it'll, it'll require players who have only played the, the more recent kind of open world style games to, to think a little differently about Zelda. So I'm really excited to see how, how players react to that who haven't played it before. Yeah, it, it, I think for people that are that are used to the more modern uh, Legend of Zelda games, it's what they'll find with this game is it's much more dense. Like there, mm-hmm. it is a, it is like you said, even though the island is fairly spacious, it feels like every screen is is really packed, uh, and even just yeah. traversing sometimes there's there's some puzzles there to figure out. So there's a lot to really dig into and and kind of pull out of that game. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. That's kind of what I meant to say. Mm-hmm. It's uh, it's just very packed with with uh with everything and and looking at some of the graphics just the detail that they've added um just really kind of brings the story to life and and even reveals some more uh, details about the characters that obviously on the on the game boy the graphics were very restricted but here um, we can see details about what what things are on people's tables and and stuff like that that are just really nice touches that bring the game to life so cool i'm definitely looking forward to the to the new one on nintendo switch but even then, I'll still I still may pull out the original every once in a while just for that nostalgic feeling. Oh yeah, I still have mine. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jeremy, what would you list as your number one favorite Game Boy game? Yeah, so I'm gonna go with Wario Land Two on mm. this one. It's an amazing game. There's so much to it, and you mentioned Super Wario Land Two earlier and how it's very experimental. And I think that team really loved to kind of push the boundaries and do interesting and new things they broke out Wario into the lead character for the series. And that really opened the door to new creative possibilities and new styles of play that didn't really necessarily make sense for Mario. And so with, you know, Wario Land or Mario Land 3 became Wario Land. Then there was a Virtual Boy game. And this this was really Wario Land 2 was kind of where they, I think they really perfected the idea of what does it mean to have you know, this big bulky villain as the protagonist of this game. So it's it's a very exploratory game and it's very much based around collecting gold, not to get extra lives, uh, but just to, you know, advance and, and get better endings. And it's gold for the sake of gold because Wario is greedy. And in fact, there are no extra lives because there are no lives in this game because he can only be inconvenienced. And so, you know, you have to actually take advantage of him being inconvenienced sometimes. Uh, like catching fire or being turned into a zombie is the the sort of the solution to the puzzles built into some of these levels. And there are so many levels. The game seems like it has 25 levels when you first start playing. And that's a lot. But once you finish, you you discover that there's like 
25 levels you haven't seen, and you have to figure out, how do I find these other 25 levels? So you have to really go back into the other stages that you've already completed and look for secrets and hidden passages. And then each kind of branch can, uh, you know, lead to its own ending and then there's a true ending once you've beaten all 50 stages and gotten all the treasures in each of the stages it's just such a huge game it's so creative it's really lovingly crafted uh, it was originally a monochrome game boy game but like six months later the game boy color came out and they put it on game boy color it's almost exactly the same game but with a you know with a color palette but whichever version you play it's just it's a masterpiece of game design and i really love it mm-hmm yeah, I love the Wario Land series, and I think I probably started with, I want to say it was Wario Land 4 on Game Boy Advance, if that's right, and uh, and then went back and tried to check out the earlier versions. Yeah, they're all great, and I, I do love, I appreciate that it split off and became its own thing, because like you said, it just introduced so many new ideas and really gave platforming fans something wholly new and in, in, in addition to the, the, uh, the Super Mario series. So yeah, that's a great, great game and a great franchise. Totally worthy of your number one pick. My number one pick is going to be Tetris, which I kind of tipped my hand a little bit earlier on. It was the one that really um, just pulled me in at the launch. And it's not, you know, over the over the course of the years, of course, there's been versions that had additional features or, or did certain things better. Um, and there have certainly been a lot more games that came out after launch on the Game Boy that had, you know, a lot more content and pushed the, the, t- the tech of the, the system a lot further. But um, I just, uh, you know, there was something really magical about that because for me, puzzle games didn't really exist before Tetris. And, you know, I liked all genre of games, especially back then I would play anything. And so this just felt, in addition to to having a a great new experience playing a portable system, it just felt entirely new, you know, when paired with Tetris. And and I still feel like it was certainly my most played game. It was the one that you could just pull out a Game Boy, turn on, play for minutes at a time, or, or sit there and play for an hour if you wanted. So in that way, I feel like it's the, the ultimate handheld game. And uh, I still have such fond memories of it that um, I was very happy for Tetris 99, uh, which is on Nintendo Switch now, when they introduced, uh, I think it was the prize you could get for competing in uh, one of the Tetris Maximus events, is you could unlock the the theme that made Tetris 99 look like the, the classic Game Boy version of Tetris with the same kind of black and white graphics and the same music. And that's how I play Tetris 99 because it, it, nothing beats uh, those nostalgic memories of, of first getting Game Boy and spending so much time with that game for me. Yeah, it was the ultimate, it was the ultimate store demo game because you would see it and you'd be like, oh, what's this? And you'd start playing it and then you wouldn't want to stop. So you'd end up taking a system home with you. Yeah, absolutely. All right, now really quickly, um, I asked uh, each of us to pick one hidden gem game. This is one, now we, I think some of the games that have been on our list so far, you could argue, were games that not necessarily everyone had heard of. But what are the, the more obscure titles that really deserve uh, the, the love and attention here? Um, let's start, uh, Dan, again with you. <laughs> well, there were, t- there were so many um, to pick from. But the one that I that I wanted to call out and that I think was is really a great game is one that was called X. It was only released in mm. Japan. We never released it here, um, but uh, it was a Nintendo game, um, and it was done in you know full 3D with uh, um, you know kind of vector looking graphics, I guess, um, similar to like the old arcade game Battle Zone, um, but uh, with with different scenarios. You're basically driving around in a in a um, tank on these planets and doing actual missions in 3d and um it was just a fun game uh i was uh, able to you know kind of sit in with the developers a little bit on this one and um a lot of the th- concepts and things that i think they learned from this um you know were, were things that were matured in future games like Star Fox and things like that so um if you ever get a chance to to play this as an import or something i would i would definitely recommend it of course it's going to be in, in japanese but um you know, I think playing around with it, people can probably figure out the missions. Right. Yeah, I think for North American audiences, maybe it's a bit of a missing link to all this stuff that came later. Great. Um, Jeremy, what would be your hidden gem game? All right. Uh, so this one, anyone who listens to the podcast I host, Retronauts, can can guess what I'm going to say. But I have to um, I have to give props to a uh, game called Heiankyo Alien, mm. which... Uh, came out here uh, pretty early on in the Game Boy's life from a company called Meldak. And um, it was actually a remake of a 
PC game from Japan in like the late seventies that showed up in the arcades and then kind of fell off the radar for a long time. And eventually they remade it for Game Boy. And it, it's one of the first games that um, kind of did the trap them up thing, you know, and it was a kind of a, a phenomenon at the time, you know, in the, the late seventies in Japan. And um, on Game Boy, it's really great because not only is it, you know, the classic PC game uh, ported over to the Game Boy, but it's one of the first instances I can think of of like a proper remake because there is a new mode for it, which has good, nice, you know, colorful, not colorful, but, uh, you know, personality filled graphics, kind of cartoonish and new game mechanics, uh, new music. It's a it's a really fantastic little game, a little great little piece of history, and I think it still is a lot of fun today. And uh, I'm always calling back to Hey on Go Alien is like, oh yeah, it's the origin point of this thing. So it's a running joke, but you know, even if it is a little bit of an inside reference, and you know, kind of a, a like, oh, Jeremy mentioned Hey on Go Alien again. I, I make no apologies. It's a fantastic game, <laughs> really a really great part of video game history. Yeah, it was on my short list for sure. <laughs> That's great. That's awesome. Well. Well, mine would be um, a game called Mole Mania, which was actually mm. a Nintendo game mm. and um, was a bit of a puzzle game, uh, although not at all like a Tetris. It was, um, uh, I'm going to have trouble explaining it, but you've essentially got a field and you control a, a cute little mole with a red tie, not unlike a Donkey Kong's tie. And you um, kind of dig into uh, holes and you can see above the ground. But once you dig into a hole, you look at kind of what the, the below the ground situation looks like. And so you're kind of navigating these little mazes and figuring out these little puzzles to get to your objectives and get from one screen to the next. And um, it's another one of those games um, that uh, I hadn't heard of when it initially came out, but I went back and looked at the library years later and kind of said, what's this? And and especially since it was published by Nintendo and uh, and just really liked it. And I really wish that uh, that character in that series had continued on in some way. And, you know... Um, it fits, again, my criteria of having not just a fun game, but a great portable experience that you can pop in and play a little or a lot of. Yep, that was a great game. Yeah, cool. Well, those are our games. Thanks, guys, for putting those lists together. And uh, I think uh, anybody who wants to go back and maybe check out Game Boy, whether they want to revisit some of their their past favorites or if, if Game Boy was before their time and they want to go back and see what all the fuss was about, I think they wouldn't go wrong uh, picking any of those. All right, so continuing on the Game Boy theme, um, we're going to switch over to our Player's Pulse segment. And, uh, of course, in Player's Pulse, uh, each time we usually go out over our Twitter or Facebook channels and ask uh, uh, listeners to submit um, or answer questions or submit their own um, kind of experiences. And, of course, this time we asked uh, you guys to let us know what your favorite Game Boy memories were. And I'm going to share just a few of those here, starting with uh, one from Nate the Gamekeeper, who says... Oh man, long car rides to my friend's cabin in the summer was great. We both had a Game Boy, copies of Tetris and F1 Race and the Link Cable. So much fun. And I thought that was a great note. We got several of those people talking about playing in the car. And that's something we didn't really touch on in our conversation just now was the Link Cable. But um, being able to play games together with friends in that way. And then also, of course, just killing time during a long car ride, maybe in the summer on going on vacation. Uh, the Game Boy was perfect for that. Yeah, we kind of conspicuously didn't mention any of the Pokemon uh, RPGs themselves in our, our list, which I it's probably just, you know, it's just one of those things you can't you can't call all, all the games. But that was the series that really, you know, took a while, but that really kind of took the link cable and and I think uh, realized its potential by by creating an experience that was all about connecting with other people and trading. And that was that was the core of the game. So yeah, it's it was a, a critical part of the Game Boy's uh, hardware, like just the concept around it. Yeah, absolutely. And if our list had been a little bit longer, I definitely would have had uh, Pokemon Red and Pokemon Blue on there. And obviously for so many people, those games are synonymous with the original Game Boy. Again, just happened to be one of those games that for whatever reason I didn't play at the time. And when I finally caught up later to understand what the whole phenomenon was about... Um, I certainly appreciated it then, but it, it, I don't have as much nostalgia for it as I think most people would. Um, moving on, we have from Sky Bison. Uh, their memory uh, was taking my first selfie with the Game Boy camera and my Game Boy. That thing had a selfie mode before most of us even carried a cell phone, let alone a cell phone with a camera. 
And uh, I just thought that was a great shout out to, to those peripherals, the Game Boy Camera and then also the Game Boy Printer, which uh, I don't know how many, you know, unfortunately, I don't think I ever actually owned those. I really wish I had them now. They're, they're, they're collector's items. But uh, again, that speaks to the, uh, to the kind of experimental nature of the platform. Yeah, the Game Boy Camera was was amazing, and and I do still have mine. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the the selfie thing was was really kind of the deal with that, where you could kind of take funny pictures and print them out and p- post them around places. Um, yeah, I, I remember having a lot of fun with that thing. Yeah, I think the camera is one of the first, maybe my first encounter with Nintendo's love of gamifying really mundane concepts. And like taking something like photography and turning it into a video game. There's like the entire interface for the Game Boy camera is basically a a role playing game metaphor. Mm. And it just turns this whole like the idea of shooting crummy low res images, which were, you know, really underwhelming even at the time and, you know, late 90s and makes them kind of cool and and fun and interesting. It's, It's such a great device. I love it. That's great. All right, now I'm going to close on a couple of um, uh, similar themed um, messages here. This first one is from David Thrasher, who says, My parents buying our first Game Boy when I was a young kid. Everyone but my dad took turns with it. We only had Super Mario Land and The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening to start with. After playing Mario for a while, we tried to work on Zelda, but couldn't figure out how to get the sword at the start. After my sisters and mom gave up, I accidentally stumbled upon it. From there, my mom and I worked together to fully beat the game. We will always, sorry, this will always be my favorite game and my favorite memory with her. And then Houndstooth wrote, My late dad, brothers, and some friends would go camping uh, sometimes when I was younger. He would bring out his Game Boy, and we would see who could go the farthest in Super Mario Land. No one could beat him. He could go through the game twice on one life. Thanks for the memories with dad. I just thought those were really sweet memories, and it also um, underscored something that that I experienced um, with my own family is that uh, is that it seemed like a lot of the parents uh, got clued into games through their their kids' Game Boys, and my dad was one of those dads when I was a kid who was you know, like, "Oh, you don't need you know the NES," and then when the Super NES came out, "Oh, you don't need the Super NES; you already have the NES." But he got hooked on Tetris for Game Boy, and um, it was great being able to share my love of gaming with him that way. Did you guys have any similar um, experiences with uh, whether it be um, going out on the road with their going camping with family or anything like that, just coming together over the, the platform? <laughs> well, my kids grew up with Nintendo <laughs> since, uh, <laughs> you know, they were babies when I was working here. And uh, yeah, they, they definitely, um, it was kind of a reverse osmosis, I think, with us where they watched me play for a long time. And then one day I think they decided they wanted to play and then it was just all over because they got way better than me. <laughs> <laughs> so they can kill, still kill me in Mario Kart and Tetris and all, and pretty much any game. Um, they're really good. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't, I don't have kids myself, but, um, I, you know, I do get to be the cool uncle who knows people at Nintendo, which is, you know, one step removed from the cool uncle at Nintendo. So, uh, that, 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 that's not so, not so bad. That's great, and I have to say that I I, uh, I, uh, I I appreciated the comment that the first letter writer wrote about uh, having trouble finding the sword in uh, the Legend of Zelda: Link's Awakening. Because even to this day, when I played the uh, E3 demo of the reimagined version for Nintendo Switch, I um, I still couldn't find the sword. <laughs> I, it's the easiest thing; it's the first thing you do, and for some reason, I kept walking past it for whatever dumb reason. Anyway, yeah, I've, I've, I heard that that uh, from some people who went to uh, San Diego Comic Con that there were some people who were struggling with it. <laughs> <laughs> nice to see that the problems of the past uh, continue to a new generation of gamers. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, now we're going to move on to um, pros picks, and just really quickly here, I just want to see what we've been playing lately on Nintendo systems, and uh, what, we, what we might recommend to um, to uh, other people. Um, Dan, uh, what have you been up to with Nintendo Switch? Oh, Nintendo Switch specifically. Um, well, I've been playing Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3, The Black Order, um, of course. <laughs> it's really fun, and I, I'm a longtime comic fan. Um, really looking forward to the Fantastic Four. They're, they're kind of my, my favorite of all time, but you know, there's plenty of other great heroes in the, in the game right now. And uh, so that's really fun. I'm also playing a lot of the mobile games since I work on the team that works on those games now. So Dr. Mario World and Fire Emblem Heroes, Animal Crossing Pocket Camp, uh, Dragalia Lost. They're really fun games too. So, yep. 
Well, it's nice when uh, you can spend all day working on games and still enjoy them <laughs> enough to want to play them in your spare time. That that says good things about the games, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. All right, uh, Jeremy, how about you? What have you been playing lately? Uh, I mean, man, most of my time actually has been spent playing Game Boy games lately. <laughs> uh, you know, like... I've been playing Game Boy Wars 2 and discovering that import game that kind of laid the groundwork for Advance Wars uh, for the first time. Uh, the Legend of Zelda's Link's Awakening Deluxe. Um, so I haven't spent as much time lately with Switch as I'd like, but I did recently kind of jump into Umihara Kawase Fresh, which is a sequel to an old Super Famicom game that never came to the US, but it's kind of gradually started to make its way over here in sequels. Um, and it's it's kind of um, riffing on the Bionic Commando concept where you're uh, someone with like grappling wire, but it's really physics based and you've got like this uh, extreme elasticity to your grappling wire. So it's really hard to kind of master the physics. But once you get a handle on it, you can you can do all kinds of wild things. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm really happy this series, which has always been kind of like a cult favorite, has started to have. Uh, better visibility in the U.S. So uh, I really want to spend more time with that because I'm I'm not good at the physics, but I, it's my my goal someday to really get a handle on uh, how the controls work in this series. You know, I'm glad you brought that up because I'd seen uh, that series, the, the the title of that series and that, that new game for Nintendo Switch, but I, it hadn't really caught my attention because I wasn't quite sure what it was. But you, you caught my attention there by referencing Bionic Commando. That's that's one of my all-time favorites, so I'll definitely be it's checking like this out. It's like buying a commando for experts. Oh, okay then. I'll definitely be checking it out. I'm not necessarily an expert at buying a commando, but uh, I'll see if I can hang in there. Um, for me, um, Fire Emblem Three Houses, I've been playing a lot of. Um, I really became a fan of that series with um, Fire Emblem Awakening. Um, once you had the option to turn permadeath off, I'm not really at the level where I can, uh, I can take... Uh, well, first of all, um, not at the level skill-wise to be able to avoid having all of my characters survive each battle, and then I hate seeing any of them go. Um, so, but I've been enjoying playing um, every game since then uh, with that feature turned off. And then um, this game in particular, there's just so much new stuff to do. I mean, they really embrace the role of you being a professor at this school, and you're setting lesson plans, and you're helping the characters kind of uh ultimately it's all about steering them toward how they're going to evolve and level up and what skills they're going to be great in and what classes there are available to them um so it's just kind of another way of approaching that but it's a very novel and fresh approach i think so i've really been getting into that um also i joined the black eagles uh which is the house yeah black eagles yeah edelgard's house although cloud and dimitri from the other two houses golden deer and blue lions are, are both uh really interesting characters but um i don't know something about uh, uh, Black Eagles pulled me in on that one. And then also um, Towerfall, which isn't a new game, but it's it's one that had caught my attention. I think I actually um, bought it from Nintendo eShop when it first came out um, on Nintendo Switch uh, quite a while ago. But I knew it was from Matt Makes Games, who had, who had uh, created um, Celeste, which I love. And um, I'd never had an opportunity back then, I think, to really play it with another person. And obviously, it's really, I think there is some single player content, but it's primarily a multiplayer game. And I got the chance to play it with my son recently, and we are really enjoying this game. It's it's almost like a fighting game, but you're shooting arrows, and it's basically one hit wins. Um, but it's just constant fast pace, you know, round after round. You know, the, before you can kind of scream that you just, you know, got uh, an arrow in the back of your head in, in, in one round you're off to the next one and you're trying to get uh you know your revenge and it's a it's a very um has that old school pixel look to it as well so you know i love any game that that kind of um has that nostalgia to it for me so um that's one if people have been sleeping on it like i was i think people should definitely check it out especially if they've got friends i think up to six people can play that game together even though we've just been playing it two players so another great one to check out All right, now, before we run out of time, I do want to squeeze in the Warp Zone quiz. Um, as regular listeners will know, this is uh, when we I, I offer some clues, and, and the guests try to guess games that came out 10, 20, and even 30 years ago. And this time, we're going to be looking at games released during the month of July. You guys ready? Maybe. Sure. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Jeremy's we'll going to carry us. We'll see. All right, I'm expecting great things. You both strike me as incredibly knowledgeable um, uh, players. So 10 years ago... In July of 2009, 
The clues are that Nintendo published a great summer game for Wii that was the sequel to one of the platform's defining titles and was one of the first Wii games to support an enhanced level of motion control. Any guesses as to what this game is? It included uh, the Motion Plus accessory and a dozen different sporting events. Oh, um, was it Wii Sports Resort? That's it, Wii Sports Resort. Yeah, that's actually um, my favorite sports in that were basketball and frisbee. But uh, yeah, that was um, kind of, a, a, I guess, an evolution of motion control at that point. And obviously mm-hmm. the sequel to Wii Sports, which was uh, one of the biggest games and initially the pack-in for the Wii system. All right, now we're going to go to 20 years ago in July of 1999. The clues are Nintendo published a game for N64 that added the Seven Wonders, Multi-Squares, Mono-Squares, and Four-Player Multiplayer to a classic puzzle series. Any guesses on this one? Clue here is that this is a series we were talking about in detail a little earlier in our Game Boy discussion. Um... Something Tetris related, uh, <laughs> Tetris Sphere, Tetris Sphere maybe. Yeah, and I got to tell you, this was. Um, it turns out that 20 years ago in July of 1999, I could only find two games, but one of them was the new Tetris. The new Tetris. The new Tetris, and I kind of remembered it when I saw it, but I wouldn't have remembered yeah. it if someone had just asked me. I knew it was something Tetris, but I was like, Jeremy is like something something Tetris. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now we're half of it right. <laughs> yeah. Now we're going back to the glory days of NES, 30 years ago, July 1989. And the clues are Capcom published an action game for NES that was a home version of a popular arcade game that didn't play anything like the original arcade version, in which a hero named Hero could use his Blue Dragon console to transfer to various stages and attempt to destroy the Zane mind control weapon that threatened the world. Any guesses on this one? How many years ago was this? This would have been 30 years ago in July of 89. 89. And this character, Hyru, if I'm saying his name right, it's probably more like Hiru. Oh, oh, yeah, Strider. Strider. There you go. Strider. Yeah, that's a game that uh, I love the arcade version, and it it was kind of known at the time for having really big sprite graphics. And then when the home version came out, it was completely different, but I still really enjoyed it. Um, In fact, it was kind of great to get a brand new game. Yeah, they were they were totally different, and I remember renting Strider for NES, thinking, "Oh, it's going to be just like the game I love in the arcades," and it it was not. <laughs> but yeah, it, it has that exploratory Metroidvania kind of thing going on for it, so I really enjoyed it anyway. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, I remember that being a good game. Yeah, yeah, any game that has any anything to do whatsoever with kind of a Metroid style game, um, I'm definitely up for. Well, great, thanks you guys. Um, those were some uh, tougher ones this month, but uh, I think we got there. And before we go, I want to talk about um, games coming up uh, over the course of the next few weeks um, in the segment we call The Game Forecast. Um, On July 25th, we've got Fantasy Strike coming from Sterling Games, uh, P-Cross, Lord of Nazarick from Jupiter, Mighty Switch Force Collection from Way Forward, and then on July 26th, we have, of course, Fire Emblem Three Houses from Nintendo and Wolfenstein Youngblood from Bethesda Softworks. Then on August 20th, we have Rad from Bandai Namco and Double Fine. And then on August 21st, we have Oninaki from Square Enix, uh, developed by Tokyo RPG Factory. And on August 30th, we have Astral Chain from Nintendo, developed by Platinum Games. Um, does it, do any of those games kind of pop off to you guys as being something you're especially excited to play? I need to learn more about this Picross game. I did not realize there was another one coming out. Not that I'm caught up with all the Picross games yet, but I'm always a sucker for those. So anytime one shows up, I'm like, bye. Yeah, I'm the same way. And this is from Jupiter, who makes, um, mm-hmm. I think, Picross S, the Picross S series on Nintendo Switch and, is, mm-hmm. and may have even worked on Mario's Picross back in the day. So great legacy of Picross games there. I'm not familiar with the um, Lord of the Nazarick. I think it may be like a... Uh, Maybe it's an anime or something that's tied in. I'm not sure about that. But it has this whole kind of theme to it that's really unique for a Picross game. Hmm. Yeah, I definitely want to check that out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you already talked about Fire Emblem Three Houses. I'm really looking forward to getting into that. Um, you know, obviously, I've seen a few things about it, but I've tried to avoid too many spoilers. Um, and I'm just looking forward to diving into it and exploring some of the stuff that you talked about, Chris. 
Yeah, absolutely. And there's a lot of stuff here that I'm, I'm definitely going to play. But in addition to what you, you guys have said, I think Astral Chain is one that I keep getting more and more interested in. Um, obviously, Platinum has a great pedigree with, with action games, but this one seems to be even be broadening out to uh, include experiences that you wouldn't normally expect in a Platinum game, like some detective work and a big open world exploration and, and all that stuff. And then Mighty Switch Force. Um, I love Way Forward, and I love the the, the cool kind of um, experimental games they put out. Um, this one collects, um, I think, four previous games in the Mighty Switch Force series, which are kind of quirky and funny with great humor and animation. Um, they kind of pack in some platforming and some puzzles. And, uh, and it's great because if you've only played the original Mighty Switch Force, it includes that game, but it also includes kind of the HD remastered version. Um, which has you know all new graphics and it's a great way to re-experience that game. So really enjoying going back through those again. Yeah, when you said way forward, I was in. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> they, they've done some great stuff. A lot of yeah. licensed stuff that is probably sometimes better than you would have expected it to be. And then a lot of their original stuff, obviously yep. Shantae, which is great. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, guys, Jeremy and Dan, thanks so much for coming on the show. It's been fun talking to you guys about Game Boy and everything else. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks for the invitation. Great. See you next time. That's it for this episode of Nintendo Power Podcast. If you have any comments or questions you'd like us to consider answering on the show, you can email us at nintendopowerpodcast at noa.nintendo.com. Also, we always appreciate it if you can leave a review and be sure to subscribe so you get new episodes as soon as they're ready. Thanks for listening and keep playing with power.